welcome um welcome back to some familiar names and faces so thanks for joining in on part three um i'm sad that there's only going to be one more after this but i feel like it's going to be a pretty good one so um if we have any new joiners um then feel free to jump on and introduce yourself you can see some familiar faces waving there um we'll give it a couple of minutes as we usually do just to give everyone the chance to sign in um get comfortable um if you guys have any questions then feel free to drop them in the chat box which i'll be monitoring throughout or we'll be i have a question i can't share my screen can you give me access to the screen share please right let me just see okay Bear with me, everyone. I'll go full. <laughs> see what we can do. Ah, now I can. So I don't know what you pressed or what I pressed, but I can do it now. Okay, good. That's uh, quite an important factor there. So. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, cool. Yeah. So um, we had some great questions last week um, for anyone who wasn't with us um really great q a session um so definitely um get your thinking hats on um let us know any kind of comments or reflections that you might have from either this discussion or any of the past discussions we've had um it would be great to kind of learn more about what you guys are wanting to learn from this and why um how that's kind of applying to your daily lives. Um, yeah, it'd be great to get some feedback. Um, or if you just want to introduce yourself and tell us all a bit about you. Um, we'll be starting in a couple of minutes or so. And today we'll be talking about virtual sampling. Is that correct, Kelly? Yes. Great. Another very exciting installment <laughs> i have a question kelly yes um, hello joe hello um it's something that's kind of come up more and more as i listen um through these webinars but what role do you think leadership has to play in this in terms of it being adopted into mainstream into commercial do you feel like um you know, leaders, founders, CEOs really need to step up into this new way of, of changing the industry. Because to me, when I listen to you, I just think this makes so much sense. And I'm like, what, what is it? Is it a fact of like leadership? Is it um, leaders needing to be more curious? I'm just interested to get your perspective on it. I think when I wanted to work in the fashion industry, I was sort of told from a young age, that I would be better off going into an industry where I had more creative control. And that seemed like a really weird thing to say to someone who wanted to be a designer and wanted to work with garment technology and clothing, because you should be allowed creative control. And it was really saddening to think that I wouldn't have any creative control. So I, asked, I just asked why, like you did. And, and the reply was, because you don't you don't have any management consultancy experience. You don't know how to run a fashion house. You don't know anything about p &L and you don't know how to manage the books. And I think the 21st century has taught us one thing, and that is that we don't need to know those things in order to make a difference in what it is that we're trying to do. I think that what we need to be able to do is find a way to speak and be evangelical about what we make and let the garments and the objects and the fashion speak for itself. It's not a case of sort of standing on a hill and hoping that everyone's gonna come along or be the Pied Piper and dance through the streets of a, a medieval city. It's more about speaking from a place of truth. And I think that me working in technology now, I've sort of come full circle and I feel like I can bring truth through technology to what it is that I want to do. So now I have to go and knock on a few doors and just well break a few doors down to try and move people out of that McKinsey approach to management consulting 
and closer to more of an evangelical approach to look, this is our truth, let's sell that truth. And then that should kind of echo through your teams. I hope that answers the question. It totally does, Kelly, it totally does, yeah. Thanks for your point of view on that, I really appreciate it. Oh, well, great, thank you. Thanks for kicking us off there, Joe. Um, great, so let's make a start on today's webinar. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I am Amanda. I am the Events and Partnerships Manager for Lone Design Club. Um, I'm also heading up the LDC Accelerator, which is a platform to give brands the necessary information to grow and scale as successful businesses. Um, and this is very exciting um, to be discussing about innovation and technology and to be working about so real. Um, so now I'll be passing back off to Kelly, um, who's going to take us on another inspirational journey today. Thank you. Yeah, so today we're going to talk about virtual sampling um, as ever. Uh, please ask questions. Um, I know that you guys will. A lot of the opinions here are not the opinions of the general scene. Um, they come from a place of, of me. And I am, uh, as you know, Kelly Vero, somebody who's been working for 25 years in technology, developing video games and applications. I like to think that maybe I'm a fashion innovator, I'm not sure. A few of the concepts that I've created and developed over the course of the last couple of years particularly have been pretty innovative. And I'm also a technology mentor um, for men and women who work within a variety of verticals. I work as the head of game development, fashion and collections at SoReal based in Switzerland. Um, so I'm bringing to you today some snippets and some good ideas with which I hope you can share with your teams or individually to motivate and drive you towards what you really want to do and be, uh, either in fashion, supply chain, or any area of this vertical. So today's objectives offer us to explore tech in its various stages of the sample process. I want you to understand existing and transferable techniques and I want you to provide discussion points for your team or for us here today. What's the problem? There's no problem, right? We've got so many steps in virtual sampling that, uh, sorry, in sampling that we don't need a virtual solution. We've got first samples, we've got PPs, we've got shipment samples, and then we've got the gold seals, we've got the red tags, we don't need to bother about anything that's virtual, right? Everything should stay as it is in fashion. That's the kind of thought and feeling that I get when I'm faced with the possibility of creating some new innovative concept or some new kind of technology that will really help us to be able to drive past maybe the old ways and start to think about how we can develop fashion in a new way. And then also we're feeding a beast. Um, according to the course report in 2017, 57% of the samples that we create end up in landfill. Um, and the average consumer is now buying 60% more items of clothing than in 2000. So I don't want to constantly reinforce, you know, the spectre of wastage that's hanging over us, but it is a reality. And rather than talk about ways that we're going to be able to change garment provenance by recording the source of where fibres come from, or building fibres from mushrooms or new techn technological innovations in textile, why don't we just get rid of waste? <laughs> and why don't we stop feeding the beast? Four fifths go into waste disposal streams and one fifth goes into recycling and sorting streams in fashion. And this isn't on. The vast majority of clothes in the waste disposal stream, roughly 70% will go to landfill and 30% will be incinerated. This isn't something that can be sustained by us on the planet. And that follows the entire supply chain process. It's not just about making clothes. It's about wasting generally. 
and that's from cardboard boxes to plastic hangers. We have to change the way we think about this. So I thought about changing it a little bit and I'm not alone in doing this, there's quite a few of us. If you came to last week's discussion, we talked about digital sustainability for fashion and I showed you the cultivation, PLM, scrapping or recycling and then area of responsibility retail governance section. Going fully digital is an option. Drake definitely thinks so, and I agree. <laughs> I'm now going to hear from Drake's lawyers. Um, the way that we should be going should be in the direction maybe of more digital design. That's definitely a go. But you're still only on the cusp of digital maturity. So how can we introduce virtual sampling or digital design earlier into the design process? How can we introduce it into PLM as a whole? And what can we do in terms of direct development? Digital should be involved in every single stage of the supply chain. And I've talked about this last week and ways that we can make changes. But this week, I kind of feel like it's okay, Kelly, you, you've talked about the theory. Now you need to show the, the process and you need to show what the end result is because no one's going to believe you if you just keep saying digital, digital, digital sustainability. So that's what I want to do today. You can look at design as phase innovation. There should be a design phase, a quality control phase and an evaluation phase within this um, entire end-to-end -end sample um, step. So it's not one step as we saw, it's about 16, maybe more. In the design phase, yes, definitely, we can sample by showing different versions of the same skirt or developing our models using Clo, Optitex, Browseware, whatever. In the quality control phase, we've got to be able to dive deeper into the fiber. We've got to look at stitching, we've got to look at quality. We need to look at things like MTM and GSD. And in the evaluation phase, and that is when your B tailor has your item of clothing almost in hand, in uh, quotation marks, they should be able to literally feel that garment near them. They should be able to critically um, evaluate that garment or that piece of apparel. How can you do that digitally? Well, it's easy if you have the digital detail. Um, so let's see how we can let the healing begin. From the proto sample or the first sample, okay, we can use any of the design wear um, programs. But then as we start to go through, we need to bring in other possibilities or other programs and tools from fit to size sets. We have to give the salesman because, you know, to some extent, the fashion industry still does operate on this very face to face. I can smell, you know, the level of your interest, salesman style, um, old fashioned delivery. And, and then there's the photo shoot samples. What is the model going to wear? Forget about all of that. Start to do things digitally. Create a digital catwalk. I'll talk about this next week, actually. But start to think of fashion as not being something that has to be so physical. That you don't need to have a salesman actually physically sharing swatches, getting you to feel things, getting you to understand stuff. I, myself, talking to you right now, I'm a salesperson. So naturally, as a salesperson, in this time of pandemic, I have to spend maybe eight hours a day on Zoom talking to people, pitching our decks, and thinking about how people can adopt or adapt to our way of thinking in terms of digital objects. So you've got to do the same if you're creators. And creating is the easiest thing because you are the owners of your destiny without sounding really cheesy and cringe. How you want that item to appear 
either on a shop shelf or on a rail or in somebody's virtual wallet or um, hard drive depends entirely upon how you present this information. Development samples, PP samples, the counter sample and the shipment sample, you know, we see racks and racks of, in warehouses of clothing of various sizes, color ways, swatches, sets, collections. Now, I'm working with a top secret um, clothing manufacturer at the moment, and they have asked me to put together a 3,000 strong collection of garments. Easy, I said. And they said, well, why? I said, because we just make it digitally and we scale out. So we stop thinking about things as being a physical this or a colorway of that. And we start to think about things as what they originally were. Patterns, shapes, ideas, digital versions of themselves. Um, it's Amanda Costco from Electric Runway who sort of famously said when I, I did an interview with her a few a couple of months ago about finding the digital self. That doesn't just follow for the end user, that also counts massively for the creator. The more that you can do digitally it means that we don't have to take out this amount of real estate to, to hang clothing on rails. I'm a believer that we must support every area of economy um, when it comes to any vertical that we work in, from video games to fashion to uh, industrial architecture. People need jobs. We need to put bums on seats. But there are ways of being able to democratise how we do that by potentially teaching people how we want to see things happen. After all, when we first started out working in our particular vertical or career path, we were taught how to do things. It's all about tweaking that mindset to bring you back to the direction that you really need to go in. And if we really need to go into a digital direction, then we have to evangelize that now. And then finally, the showroom sample all the way down to the red tag. These can all be done digitally. Um, I am a strong believer that there is no need to pass samples between one outlet and another to be able to prove that it is real. Um, orders can be made on the basis of being able to use everything from haptic technology to volumetric capture. Buyers, when they attach these colored tags to approve samples and send back to the suppliers, if this involves logistics and logistics causes waste and we don't want to cause this waste um, we don't want to have to put things into cardboard boxes into polyurethane seals or into um, polythene bags what we want to be able to do is say here is the digital version of the garment that you requested behind me on the screen you can see um, that there is a digital twin of a Louis Vuitton bag. That is a Louis Vuitton bag. I don't have to prove to you that's a Louis Vuitton bag because it looks like it's worn. It looks like it's been used. It has all of the elements of the Louis Vuitton design and it's covered in the branding. Do you really need to be able to touch and feel that to know that it's real? It has assisted metadata, which enhances the value of the bag for you to be able to understand exactly every part of what went into making it and what its value is not just today, but in five years time. How do we composite this entire process into software? Let's look at some costs and some truths. These are the types of things that if you reach out to software um, organizations and businesses, studios, they're not going to tell you because they want to be able to negotiate based on your understanding of quality and not your understanding of cost. Some of you guys are small micro studios and some of you come from massive houses, but it's important to have good guidelines in terms of what you know you're getting and what you know you can afford. Let's look at volumetric capture. What is it? Well, it's what you put in at one side, you should get out of the other. 
So if I put a piece of fabric into a volumetric capture kit, usually a studio, um, which has maybe a circular wall that's covered in cameras. So that it can capture each direction of a piece of fabric or a garment or a handbag or a pair of shoes. It's a little bit like doing photogrammetry, but on a bigger scale, usually with human beings. So volumetric capture happens in modeling, for example. Um, I talked a couple of weeks ago about Madonna's appearance at the Billboard Awards, where we saw the various ages of Madonna from when she did Like a Virgin, up until she did um, uh, the Matador era. So that was all volumetric capture. Madonna was captured in a various stages of her career, and then it was presented as a hologram. How we manage that in fashion is really simple. We take a photogrammetry video of the garment item object that I just talked about, and then we pass that as a post-produced MP4, and it's outputted into uh, a cloud or somewhere that you can download it at the other end. Now, this can't be done in real time. It can be done in real time if it's holographic capture, but holographic capture is based on voxel. And voxel is like pixelated art. So it's very, very difficult to pick out detail. It's not something that I would really recommend. The MP4 and holographic capture and volumetric capture is becoming very popular for catwalk. Um, it's studio based, so you have to actually go to a place. If you use Dimensions in London, or if you use the Microsoft Mixed Reality Capture Studio in San Francisco, or uh, Metastage, those guys will actually bring a mobile unit to you. Um, there's also a, another company called Scannable who do something similar. And though it is studio based mostly, the one off costs are between 10,000 and 30,000 per minute in your local currency. Per minute. That is a lot of money if you are thinking about doing something off LFW or off MFW. If you want to do something sort of um, small, this probably is not the medium for you. And finally, again, the MP4 output means that it could be less secure than your average because things that you put into the cloud can be stolen from the cloud oftentimes. Um, be aware that videos that are played now, like this one, can be found in YouTube next week. So anything that is discussed here, um, I have to accept that it's we're open season. You know, there are no secrets here. I wouldn't want there to be any secrets between me and LDC anyway. These guys are fantastic. Secondly, point to point live streaming. We call it high definition render pipeline um, in the games industry, and it's becoming something that is really popular. There's no loss of quality, it's real time, it's made for fabrics, textiles, and textures. And um, it has something in it which is fantastic called specularity that you can see on the model here. So specularity is the, the kind of glistening or metallics or gloss that's associated with uh, specific items of jewelry, a belt buckle, for example, a necklace, a ring, um, gold shiny shoes, etc. If you If you fancy yourself as a bit of a gold lame, fan and you want to present something that doesn't lose any quality of the gold lame then point to point live streaming is your friend because you've got complete lossless experience there also it's real time so we at so real use a product which is part of the unity family called furious and furious actually is based on a monthly subscription it's not hugely expensive not as much as you would think i think it's in the region depending on your budget, of between $100 and $500 a month. Um, it could actually be less than that. Um, but in terms of cost, it's sort of in the middle. It's not super expensive like volumetric capture. It has more detail than volumetric capture, 
and it is not going to break the bank. So if you have a big lighthouse or hero project that you want to get out there and you want to put something in your engine right now, and you want somebody to see it in Shanghai right now, then high definition render pipeline is your friend because you won't have any of that pixelation. If you want something in your pocket and on your laptop, tablet, then I can't think of anything better than choosing gaming technology. I'm a huge advocate because I come from a gaming background. I use Unity or Unreal mostly, and it's a load up and go. So if I create an environment in my Unity application on my screen or my Unreal application, you should be able to see it if you download my uh, executable file. It's a little bit like going to the app store and downloading Candy Crush. I play the same version of Candy Crush that you do. I don't get anything better than you. I get exactly the same as what the guys at King have created in Candy Crush. So we all have a shared experience. But me as the creator and owner, any time that I want to change this, I just update the, the application. I just re-upload some information. I add something new to my collection you get to see it. What's also great about it is it's in your pocket. So you can take it wherever you want to take it. If you want to show somebody in Shanghai what it is that you're doing and you're based in Manchester, it is literally as easy as saying, please download this build into your mobile phone. Please download this build onto your screen and you should be able to see what I can see. And the great thing about Unity these days is that the quality of what you see on the screen is becoming better and better. So originally on the right hand side of this image, that's what we used to be able to see on Unity. It was pixelated, it was a, not exactly round, and now we're able to add enough texture onto it that we don't lose the quality. And we don't have to download really massive files in order to make this happen, and that's what's important. And even better is these days with Unreal and Unity, other game engines are available, you can build in VR and AR. We have, we built our demo in AR kit, but we're also doing a virtual sampling tool at the moment, which I'm going to talk about in a second, in Unity, and it looks magnificent. Um, but obviously I'm quite biased because it's me that designed it. Here's how we did ours. Now, this is controversial because you guys are not ready for this but I am, I was born to do this. I really like playing games and I come from a games industry background. So it's an absolute no brainer to create a virtual footwear sampler that revolves around Tom Clancy's Ghost Recon. Now this game is really special because you can pull apart guns and augment them and use them tactically in any type of operational theatre. That's really scary, totally controversial. I completely appreciate that some people don't like this style of gameplay, but it's not the style of gameplay that I'm really interested in either. What I'm interested in is how you pull things apart. As a designer, I want to know how things get put together and also how things get pulled apart. So when I was thinking about how to design a footwear sampler, I went directly to the source of the best game I could think of, and that was Tom Clancy's Ghost Recon. Their weapon selector and modificator is like a configurator that you would find in Nike or Adidas, but it has something value added, and that is a lot of metadata. So I wanted to be able to create an experience where you would be able to look at a shoe, and you would also be able to find out all of the information about the shoe. So I started designing it and thinking, okay, let's break it down. How can we make this work? I wanted an object selector. I needed a random selector, like a shuffling mode. I wanted to explode the shoe because I wanted to see the layers of the shoe. And then I wanted to optimize certain layers or certain areas or instances. And then, of course, I need to read the metadata because again, if I'm dealing with supply chains, I need to be able to speak between Manchester and Shanghai. I need uh, Joe, who's in the stream here, to be able to talk to somebody in South Africa. 
at the same time as she's sitting in her living room in Lancashire. So I wanted something that was bit of material friendly, that was detailed enough for it to be a configurator, and that later on I would be able to load in extra or new items to be able to share with whomever is in the supply chain. And that could be at any stage of the supply chain from design to retail. So I set about gamifying the core experience. What did I want it to look like? So my excellent artist, Gabriel, who may or may not be in the stream with us today, helped me to be able to break apart this Gayop shoe that you can see here. So we took this shoe to pieces um, and we did it digitally. We scanned in the shoe first. We used our unique uh, industrial CT style of scanning. And then we broke that shoe apart, we exploded it, and by exploding it, we were able to look at everything that we call these days from the inner sock to the speedboard. But really I'm talking about how is the broke put together for the Oxford? You know, how many holes are in the back? Um, what's the sole like? Is it vinyl? Is it leather? What type of padding do I need to put in the shoe? So we pulled the shoe apart entirely without having to pull the shoe apart physically. Because what happens if you pull the shoe apart physically? You have to put it in the bin and that means waste. We didn't want to do that. So we used a unique style of scanning to be able to pull the shoe apart without losing any of the quality of the shoe or any of the waste. And you can see here that that's what the shoe looks like. And on the other side, you can see a high quality Jimmy shoe that we did. Um, I think you've seen this like a million times before and, and the bag behind me. Um, there is no loss of quality when you're using this technique. Um, the reliance always has to be upon the software developer that you're working with and the artist. And I think I looked out by getting a really fantastic artist. Then we talked about how this could work as a real world experience. So when you look at a shoe, you want to be able to look at the whole entire shoe. You want to turn it around. You need to understand it. Um, and I have to be able to understand it because I'm just a regular person. I'm not a massive creator like you guys are. You guys create amazing stuff. I just want to facilitate you in how that happens. So I did like a little video. Um, to think a bit more about the user experience. Hopefully you'll be able to see it here. But really it's all about visioning and envisioning. What did I want it to be like? By the way, this is not final art. This is uh, what we're looking at here is um, the kind of exclusive <laughs> um, of what it will become. So this is a work in progress, but I didn't want to come today without showing you what it looked like because I know that it would absolutely wow the pants off you. Um, I wanted to look at switching things around, changing things, understanding what goes in from a bit of material perspective, having talking points with all members of your team. So by being able to explode something and show things in their different formats and their different styles, you can basically have those conversations, not just with the design team, but with the marketing teams, with the retail guys and girls, with anybody, you should be able to have those types of conversations about your designs and creations. Also, there should be instant access. And one of the key things in games that is super important is that we never put a barrier to entry into anything that we make for our end user. The more complicated you make things, the less people want to be involved. The less opportunity, therefore, you would have in fully sharing your vision. And we don't want you to do that. Uh, we want you to have an openness and an instant access across the board. So what else can we do with virtual sampling? Well. As I said before, you know, we have to create something that has instant access. So fast design and rapid prototyping. I am a big rapid prototyper. The moment things are broken, or I think they're not going to be fixed, 
I put them in the mental bin. I forget about them. And then a few months later, I open the drawer of my brain and I pull out that amazing idea and I revisit it again. But I don't hang on to ideas because ideas, unless they come to fruition in the way that you want them to, you shouldn't be iterating constantly on the same idea. You should be iterating quickly and moving on. Metadata and PLN activity is very important to me. A lot of people that I deal with have big questions like, yeah, but what's in the bill of material? Yeah, but what's the general sewing data going to be? I've solved those problems, whether I'm creating t-shirt bags and boxes or exploding shoes. The social talking points. When I put things onto any part of social media, oftentimes people will come and look. And one of the reasons why is because they're not going to look at a gay art shoe. They're going to look at what we did with it. They're coming to look at not just a H&M t-shirt, they're coming to look at how we can measure it. So these kind of uh, requirements in terms of social media provide fantastic talking points and they open a lot of doors for you, whether you're a creator designer or whether you're a retailer. And I think these conversations should be had and I think they need to continue to take place. And then finally, things like exact assessments, focus group testing and quality. Creating something that's on a software platform is much easier than having people in the room asking them how they feel about touching velvet. Um, I don't really think that, you know, it is as important to be able to have everybody in a room, especially at a time like social distancing, um, to be able to really get the full focus test experience. We do a lot of our focus testing in the games industry from a massive distance. If we're serving the Southeast Asian marketplace, we can't fly over to Southeast Asia every week and sit on top of people getting them to test our products. We have to do it in a distanced way. So in the games industry, we've been practicing this social distancing for a long time. And believe me, being antisocial is a great place to be. <laughs> and then there's quality. The quality of how things look, how they are. If you follow some of the things that I talked about previously in any of the weeks that we did, and obviously today, you'll understand that quality is super important and we don't lose quality by choosing digital. We're enhancing quality by choosing digital. And that should be your mantra. So don't dispose of it. Make it work. Rework it. Uh, these things that we see here from the shoemaker's diagram to this kind of early, looks like a Christian Lacroix, but it's not, it's from the 1970s. It's almost like a signal code. I think that we can work these things naturally digitally and we can make these things work for us and we should be making more of an emphasis upon how we reuse digital to our own ends and means. Anything is possible and digital is not seasonal. It is evergreen. We should be recycling everything that we make and then that allows us to be more creative. With a solid tech platform and an understanding of the user focus, you can do anything. The only thing that's stopping you from going in the direction of virtual sampling is you. As usual, here's our demo. If you want to reach out to us for the footwear sampler, you can do so. Um, but again, I just thank you for your attention, your time, and I'm happy to take any questions. You can contact me here, I'm Kelly at Surreal.ch on Twitter at Electric Asia and on LinkedIn, as you can see. I'm handing you back to our amazing moderator, Amanda, and thank you very much indeed. Thank you for that so much. That was super interesting. Again, no surprises there. <laughs> um, yeah, over to the floor. Does anyone have any questions? Um, feel free to turn on your camera. Ah. Samarful, am I saying that right? <laughs> Do you want to unmute yourself and introduce yourself, ask us your question? Sure, thank you so much, Amanda. Uh, hi, Kelly. 
My question is, first of all, I'll just give a brief uh, context for you to better understand. So my profession is I'm a merchandiser, growth strategist, and an apparel outsourcing expert in the fashion industry. So you can understand how much this all relates to me, uh, the virtual some aspect of it. So uh, the problem that I face is in one of my challenges is that I, I used to work for a company that made uh, 2D art into 3D rendered garments, which we would upload on a website and customers could buy it. So, uh, and we were really successful in creating really close matches to the real, like a photograph of the product and a 3D rendered image of the product from a 2D uh, digital art. But there was always a gap of the customers saying that the, the feel is not good enough or the performance or the texture is not good enough. So how can we bridge this gap? I, I agree with this thing that we should go for virtual sampling, but how can we bridge the gap of the expectations of someone who is touching a garment and who is looking at a screen and seeing the garment and how to make it closer? Thank you so much. In the next five years, thank you. Um, in the next five years, I think that it won't be a problem because haptic technology will take care of a lot of the feel of garments for us. Um, but I think for now, as things stand, the way that we have to be able to place ourselves in that space of being able to understand how things look and feel really comes from the metadata from the bill of material. Um, everybody knows what cotton feels like, everybody knows what velvet and satin feel like. And one of the big takeaways of omnichannel retailing over the course of the past five years particularly, is that there's such a lack of information, not just from the perspective of provenance, but from the expectations of the end user. So within that bill of material, what do we expect to feel? What do we expect to look like? How is this garment made? How is it stitched? How can we get down to the nitty gritty? And unfortunately, although I, I see that you've tried to do the 2D and 3D paint over and 3D photos are all the rage now, I'm talking about 4D semantic technology. And that means being able to get right down to the fiber. In last week's episode, we looked at garment provenance and we were able to go a few microns down into this bag behind me. And one of the things that we found from that actually was there is a lot of feel that you can get from being able to dive in to a piece of garment or texture with that much depth. So I think if the, the, the answers you're looking for lie within the feel, then you need to be going a little bit below where the garment currently is and being able to explain that through the metadata or the bit of material and PLM structure that's going to be your best friend. Thank you so much, Kelly. Amazing. Thank you for the great question there. Um, does anyone else have any other questions? Ah. Joanna um, has just put in the chat box here. Totally agree at some point, somebody requests a physical sample. Would love to know more about haptics. I also come to leadership if as a business slash CEO limits having physical sampling designers and buyers find a way. Yeah, again, I just want to reinforce that. I think that, you know, the, the, the onus relies upon the business owners to be able to find a way. And um, as a discussion point, you know, especially from the perspective of uh, both some of the luxury houses and some of the fashion weeks that we've seen over the course of the post pandemic time, there's simply not been enough adoption of this technology and there's still a heavy reliance upon what the eye sees therefore is the truth. And that's not enough. I think we have to go a little bit further down still Haptic technology, as I said, will become such a, like, everyone will be over it in the next few years. But until we are in that place, I think we have to use the technology that we have at our fingertips and the ability to go down into these samples and look at things to be able to get over that uncanny valley. Amazing. Um, so if anyone else has any, oh, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> I am so passionate about this, Kelly. So uh, lots of questions. Um, 
just because I, I've started to see it being adopted by very big retailers and I saw the impact that had, you know, going from thousands and thousands of sampling and really expensive real estate to house those to a much more streamlined uh, virtual sampling process. But, you know, one thing that people will come back to is, you know, we there are jobs created through sampling, you know, and that industry needs to be supported. Um, how easy do you think that shift is? Do you think retraining is quite straightforward? Do you think it's just a matter of rolling it out and and taking a decision on shifting those skills? I do, because I, I think that's how we all learned, right? We all started somewhere we had to learn. And I think that as we grow as creators and individuals within this business, we have to take um, our continuous professional development forward. We can't be comfortable because I find myself in my job, the more that I'm comfortable in what it is that I'm doing, the quicker these quick omnichannel retail companies come along and say, ah, we've created the perfect digital object ready for your warehouse. And, and I've lost like a lot of business at that point. So I have to be constantly adapting and thinking, where can we go with innovation? How can we future proof our jobs? And how can we future proof our ideas and our visions? Great. Um, and from Jacqueline here, does anyone know of any haptic apps or websites? Uh, yeah, if you go to the YouTube um, of the LDC um, uh, talk that I did in the first week, I list out a whole host of places where you can start to interact with VR, either from an application standpoint or from the pure hardware. A good place to start with haptics actually would be the Quest 2, which is the Oculus hardware. That is developing at a faster pace than a lot of us are prepared for, along with the HTC. But you will find that some of the smaller companies, I say smaller, <laughs> like Sony PlayStation, they're quite big. Um, these guys are not quite there yet because they are providing support to a game-based audience. Whereas Oculus and HTC are providing hardware for a lifestyle audience. So wherever possible, try and go out to the lifestyle applications. Again, you can find them on the first week that we did uh, with the LDC uh, lectures on YouTube. Um, Amanda might uh, be able to share in social streams or you can connect with her. But there's a whole raft of places that you can go to to find out more. I've also got loads of white papers. Please connect with me. There you go. Yeah. Um, again, if anyone did kind of miss the first two episodes, um, they are on YouTube. You can just type in Men Design Club. Um, and we've covered what is VR. Um, and last week was. Government provenance of the supply chain. Yes. <laughs> I was like, virtual sampling? No, that's this week. Um, that's today. <laughs> so, um, yes, if you did miss them, then check them out. Um, and as we've mentioned, next week we will be discussing rethinking fashion. Um, if anyone has any questions, then now's definitely the time to ask. Um, if not, then you can always get in touch with us later. Um, but Kelly, do you want to give us a bit of an introduction for next week's uh, webinar? Yes, next week we'll be looking at the changing face of the catwalk, uh, the changing face of the uh, warehouse, how we are shopping and, you know, what the impact is on the end user from an e-commerce perspective. Um, and it will allow us to be able to, I guess, incorporate a lot of the learnings that we've had over the course of the last three weeks, especially. I'm sure you guys will all go to the mountain over the course of the next week and come back um, with some fresh ideas. And uh, hopefully we can put them all together next week and, and finish this series off. It's been a fantastic series, Amanda, so I'll be sad to say goodbye. I know. What are we going to do after that? <laughs> I'll be here at Wednesday, 4 p.m. Like, where is everyone? <laughs> um, but yeah, <laughs> thank you. Um, lovely comments there from Joanna. Um, but yeah, this has been another great webinar, super insightful again. 
And um, if anyone wants to find out more information about the LDC Accelerator, you can follow us on Instagram at LDC Accelerator um, or check out the LDC website, plenty of information there. Um, and definitely do connect with Kelly. Um, she is a fountain of knowledge, as I'm sure you're all aware by now. Um, so definitely connect. Um, yeah, otherwise we'll see you guys next week. Thank you for your time, everyone. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye.